I've always assumed that being black did pay, play, despite the fact that affirmative action did not exist at that time, that being black was a positive factor in my getting into Harvard. Harvard had that reputation, and also my mother's uncle had gone to Harvard. He was in class of 1913. If I was affirmative action admit, I was clearly not affirmative action graduate, okay? I earned that thing, okay? Fifty years ago, these three men were part of a small group of blacks admitted to Harvard College. It was a time when blacks were called Negroes and faced racism, prejudice, and lack of opportunities throughout the country. After 323 years of being an exclusive white man's institution, Harvard College admitted the largest number of African Americans in its history. The year was 1959, the number was 19. And I was one of them. My name is Kent Garrett. 50 years ago, I was a freshman here and lived in this dorm behind me. We were recruited from different high schools around the country, from different economic and political backgrounds. But what we had in common were our experiences with racism. I was born in Cuba in 1940, and uh, we lived in Havana. Uh, my grandmother came to Cuba as a slave at the age of seven. When I was 13, Emmett Till was murdered, and I saw my mother, she didn't cry at the murder, but when Lawrence Rainey and Cecil Price, when they were acquitted, I saw my mother cry for the first time in my life. No emphasis on race. That wasn't, we didn't talk much about it. it was, this was, we're trying to free this kid up. And they're also hiding me from the fact that the restaurants were segregated. So my parents would always say, well, you know, um, we don't, people of, of, of breeding, odd term, people of breeding, uh, good character and background, do not eat in public places. Um, we go to visit homes, homes of our uh, well-educated refined friends. In South Carolina, like I would go um, to visit my grandfather who had a, a, a beef farm and grew cotton down there. And when I went down there, I mean, we'd have to change trains. Like we would take a train uh, to Washington and in Washington we'd have to change to the black train to f go the rest of the trip. Before I came to Harvard, I went to Washington, D.C. With my, with my mom and sisters, and I had two white high school guys from my um, class in Benton Harbor, and we met, and we were going to go to this ride in Virginia. We didn't know anything about the um, segregated amusement parks. So when I went there with them, I couldn't go into the amusement park, so we didn't go. And um, that gave me... Uh, more insight into what the kids were doing down south. We were brought up to feel good about ourselves. Um, we were given excellent training in, in the segregated schools we went to, even though we didn't have all the resources that everyone else had. We had these teachers who were so dedicated to passing something on to us that I have never, ever had any doubts about my ability. We entered Harvard as Negroes, but graduated as blacks. In fact, because of what happened to us and the nation while we were there, historians might consider us to be the last Negroes at Harvard. This is our story. The first day I arrived, I, I arrived by subway at Harvard Square and came out and there was that newsstand that was there and I went to the guy at the newsstand and I asked him if he could tell me where Harvard was and uh, he laughed. 
While most of our white classmates seemed to welcome us, some saw us as curiosities. Fred Easter remembers an encounter with a curious classmate at lunch. Do you mind talking to me, is what he said. I am, um, I've never talked to a black person before. Um, he was from North Dakota. His name was Gordy Maine. He's a hockey player. And so he asked me a bunch of questions about being black, fundamentally. I mean, were you insulted that he was asking that? No, or that no, 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 was... no. He was clearly asking in the sense of what you, we would call academic inquiry, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and um, it was cool. We got to be friends. He didn't ask what I would call insulting questions, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you suntan or anything like that? We were the subjects of at least two controversial class sociology projects by white students. We didn't really know. Were we guinea pigs? Were we tokens? Were we just students? What, what was going on? The Bright Shadows in the Yard study was done by our classmate, Ron Blau. He was taking a seminar with sociologist David Reisman, author of The Lonely Crowd. It was not as defensive a time as it is now. I mean, we were all freshmen. I didn't get any rejections when I asked people to, to be interviewed. One of the questions in the Bright Shadow Studies was if you were reborn tomorrow, either as a white or as a Negro, which would you choose? I was somewhat surprised to find that, no, people liked being who they were. And even if there were, would have been advantages to being white, that would have meant losing something of who they were. Hobie Armstrong, who was labeled Al in the study, remembers saying he'd like to try it for a year and then decide. For the most part, we lived our daily lives not unlike other Ivy League students. I had a glorious time at, at Harvard. I longed to be in a community of people who valued the life of the mind, who valued uh, diversity. I was the fastest guy on the team. Uh, they weren't set up for a guy as fast as I was. I, I could uh, get a ball, and people that were supposed to block for me, I would have to like stutter step or wait until they got in front of me. There, there was no what I would call black social life at Harvard. You would go to a mixer. You would ask a white girl to dance. She would dance with you and everything like that, you know. But it was sort of like, you know, the straight arm, uh, don't please, don't get too close, and things like that. But we sometimes felt like 1890 Harvard graduate W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote that he was in Harvard, but not of it. Was I uncomfortable at Harvard? Yeah, I mean... No. No, not uncomfortable, but I was careful I mean, it would not have occurred to me to sort of speak Ebonics, which is how I spoke when I got home, okay? When I got to Cambridge, I was never fitting to do nothing, okay? I was getting ready to, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I never wanted, I think, to appear in any of the stereotypical black ways, whatever they were. 